Welcome everyone, it's Andrew Beach, Executive Career Coach. I'm a teacher of self-education. I help professionals like you communicate your value to find great opportunities faster. And it's career happy hour. I know all of us have had some challenging situations of late. I want you to know that I'm here to answer all of your questions um, and to continue in our book club. Uh, speaking of book club, um, I'm actually doing an off um, how would I say, off of this Friday live stream book club. If you're interested, we're reading Simon Sinek's book, uh, Start With Why. So if you're interested in uh, taking advantage of a group, of a micro community, if you will, um, let me know in the chat. I'd be interested in knowing if you're interested in becoming part of that, um, that group. So um, let me know where you're joining from. I'd appreciate to hear that so, um, so that I can uh, understand better. And then we'll answer any questions that you have. Uh, typically, they're over in the chat on this side or down below. So if you're joining and you have a moment, please share this with your social channels. This is an opportunity for you and people like you to get answers, maybe even a little coaching today. Um, so I'm happy to support your success in every way possible. So uh, for some reason, I don't seem to see that I'm online on LinkedIn. So let me let me make sure that we're there. Uh, if you uh, I might have to go to my activities here. Hang tight with me for a second. Um, so good to have you. Uh, if you could let me know where you're joining from, that would be great. I'm in uh, Portland, Oregon today, sequestered in my domicile, if you will. So it's good to see all you. Yep, there we go. So I'm online. Excellent. So today, uh, Chelsea, good to see you. Uh, awesome. Yeah, I'm glad to be connected to you. And as a candidate, uh, I know that you're uh, probably going through some transition, not just from your situation, but based on the, the virus we're all facing today. Um, so I, I know that's impacting everybody. So if you can, uh, just hit the share button uh, down below. And I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has on uh, career, networking, uh, resume, interview prep. What, how are people coping with, um, with COVID? And are people still interviewing? And uh, honestly, yes, people are still interviewing. I have candidates going through final rounds in the next few days. Um, so that they're just switching to a more agile method uh, of remote delivery. And that includes things like video getting used to and comfortable with uh, video is really a key skill. So I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Hey, Fred, good to see you. Uh, Detroit in the house. Debbie, excellent. Uh, yeah, thank you for putting those thumbs up. I appreciate that. So if you can, uh, share this. Uh, click the little share button. Share it with your, your networks on LinkedIn or, or Twitter. Uh, we are broadcasting live on four platforms. That would be LinkedIn Live here and uh, YouTube, Periscope, and in my Facebook group for finding jobs fast without a resume. So I'm happy. Uh, let me know what questions you have because I know the concern today is, you know, how do we get traction in a job search? Uh, the, the general advice I have for most people is it's going to take longer. Uh, the good news is networking is becoming more of a reality for those who have seen um their, their schedules loosen up. I, I mean, think about this for a second, that people were spending 20, 30, 40 minutes, maybe an hour commuting to work each day. That's time they've gotten back. They're a lot happier. Uh, I found that because of remote delivery of um, meetings, corporate meetings over the phone or by video, that those meetings are shorter. Uh, that means that people have time on their hands. Yes, they may be at home and yes, they may have children around and four-legged friends and, and what have you. I have all those things. Um, and I'm fortunate to have a home office where I can shut a lot of that out. Um, but good. Good to see you in Charlotte there. Thank you, Eric. Um, if you're just joining us, go ahead and click the share button. I'd like to have more people involved. So generally speaking, it's going to take longer uh, to get any hiring process complete. I think for those companies that are agile in their recruitment practices, this is an exceptional opportunity to capture some high quality talent. Uh, so for those of you out there that are high quality talent, don't give up. Keep knocking on the door and something will eventually open. 
Uh, Del Myra, good to have you. P folks from Atlanta, thank you so much. Uh, go ahead and leave your questions in the chat. Share this with your, your social channels. We're going to continue our discussion today on networking. Uh, the number one book, in my estimation, about networking uh, is one that... Um, that's interesting. It didn't show up on the screen. Oh, it's because I moved the file. Well, I'll, I'll hold it up to the camera. How's that? It'll disappear. We'll do a disappearing trick. Check this out. Um, so this is the um, book that I advocate that people take a look at if they want to know how to network. Many people understand why they should network, even kind of the context of why it works. Um, but many people don't know how to network. And so we're using this opportunity as a chance for all of us. Um, excuse me. Sounds like I have, I'm hearing, oh, it's turned on. Sorry about that. I had a headset going off. So we're going to continue our discussion today in this book. So you can just sit back, grab a favorite beverage. It's the National Business Employment Book on Networking. We're into Chapter 6, uh, so we're, we're progressing. We've already talked about what is networking, how does it work, what does it look like inside of a network meeting, what are the steps to take to actually execute one of these. And now we're talking about uh, really fine-tuning for best practices. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, that means we're going to talk today about good vibes and where do they come from and why is that so important, okay? So keep that in mind as we go through here. I'll go ahead and read pages 109 to 117, and then there's a section in there where we talk about uh, different personality types. And I think that's valid. When we're in this situation of networking and talking to new people, it's important we recognize uh, their personality style or their communication style so that we can move forward in our candidacy, in our, in our process. So um, I'll start on page 109, chapter six, where good vibes come from. And so we'll do uh, part one will be these pages you see um, above, and then we'll go ahead and shoot into, um, let's see, we'll shoot into the personality types uh, next week, okay? So chapter six, where good vibes come from. Successful networking goes beyond merely showing your flag to a passive audience. It's about building rapport, getting people to know you, to like you, to identify with you, and to go to bat for you. Because rapport is rooted deeply in the subjective depths of human nature, there's often no way of telling who will turn on to you or be turned off by you. You can't compel or instruct people to like you. That's the truth. You can only give them the raw materials and let their natural inclinations take over from there. Building rapport is not an utterly hit or miss proposition. It has some ele elements of relationship building that we can discuss here without forcing you to wade through a lengthy psychological treatise. But there are some unknowable and imperceptible factors in being liked. To some extent, people simply like whom they like and help whom they want to help. Let that be you. Let that be you. Let you be the one that helps. Let's look at some elements that you can master in order to promote a constructive, energized rapport on the part of your networking contacts. How hard would it be in today's market to develop rapport? Just reach out to somebody and say, are you okay? The short version. I like the short version. Even if you have an innate distaste for discussions of touchy-feely stuff, or are you so confident in your natural warmth, self-presentation skills, or charisma that you feel little need for supplemental instruction, at least skim this chapter and memorize the briefest of its precepts. Rapport is a function of two Fs, as in Frank or Foxtrot. First one, first F, focus. Second F, friendliness. Focus, you should have down pat. That's what chapter two is all about. So chapter two in the book is about focus. If you're unable to project a clear focus right now, you will after you've had five or six networking meetings. Nothing like time in the trenches. Friendliness is, in this context, builds on the golden rule. You'll tend to get what you give. Be open and your contacts will be open. Be considerate and they'll be considerate. Be helpful and eager to please and they'll respond in kind. There's no requirement that you be a smooth, silver-tongued orator 
or a natural salesperson. Successful networking doesn't hinge on your giving a series of dazzling performances. If you get tongue-tied, lose your place, or occasionally miss the point, no one dies. If you can learn to laugh at yourself and comment candidly on your awkwardness, you have nothing to fear in a networking meeting. Go forth and have some fun. The words and the music. All interactions between people have two major components. One, manifest content, observable external behaviors and responses. And two, latent content, unspoken and often unconscious undercuts of a transaction. For our purposes, we'll call them the words and the music. Chapter two was all about the words. It's discussion of fit, emphasized self-definition and the ability to communicate that definition lucidly. Here we will talk about fit in the broader sense of understanding what factors contribute to other people's, other people's believing in you, respecting you, feeling they are like you, and feeling comfortable with you. Before we look at the traits and techniques that support these desirable impression, let's pay homage to an ability you probably aren't even aware you have. Playing your hunches. Basic hunch theory proclaims that in any interpersonal interaction, you'll feel comfortable as long in the words, as the words and the music are in harmony. The moment they diverge and begin to send different messages, you'll note and feel and sense that something isn't quite right. As you network, it's wise to learn to admit and take note that of that feeling. It's a signal that things aren't exactly as they seem. Have you ever had that feeling in an otherwise pleasant conversation that something suddenly has gone wrong? Trust that it has, or that you've lost the other person. You have. Or that the person suddenly has stopped buying your act. In all likelihood, that's exactly what has happened. Your hunches are usually right. They're the product of sophisticated perceptual and evaluative faculties you don't use consciously. Overrule your magnificent natural hunch-making ability to blithely, and you'll cripple your judgment. The rational left side of your brain provides law and order, but the right side of your turning, tuning fork, your dowser, your diviner of unseen facts and forces. From birth, your biologically driven urge to survive has led you to develop ways of distingu distinguishing warm, happy things from cold, dangerous things. Before you could talk or make logical deductions, your powers of observation we're drawing a remarkably acute, ongoing map of your world. This process has become second nature. Even after you grow up, cultivated your rational faculties, and imposed conscious reason on everything, your amazing pre-conscious radar continued, and still continues, to work. It monitors and evaluates the myriad messages sent by the people in your surroundings. It's easy to miscommunicate deliberately. That is, to lie with words, but because most of us can't control a large part of the music we radiate, it's harder to distort that part of the message in order to deceive or cover up. This is true of both parties in a networking meeting, whether they are sending or receiving. Knowing how your hunches work isn't as important as knowing that they, that they exist. True that. Of the many books on body language, transactional, contextual analysis, kinesthetics, and gestalt therapy that crowd self-help bookstore shelves, few are, are as much practical utility to you. They may make interesting reading for PhDs, but they hardly serve as field manuals for building rapport. Indeed, many of these books actually impede the spontaneity of communications by asking you to focus on a level of intuition that, un, that usually operates automatically. Many formula books suggest that you become very self-conscious and other conscious too. They suggest that you learn a hidden vocabulary so that you can bend every interaction to your will. Some state that literally every gesture, tick, or sigh has its own unique meaning and demands decoding. Her pupils just dilated. I wonder what that signals. This is simply wrong. The nonverbal communication that's the basis of our hunches 
tends to be structured around constellations of messages, some of which we're conscious of and can control, like posture, dress, and personal hygiene, some of which we can control if we concentrate on them, like gestures, use of space, eye contact, and rate of speaking, and some of which operate either automatically or unconsciously, blushing, pupil dilation, coloring, muscle tone, timbre of voice, sweating, basic gestural style. No single element acts alone. Our style and the impressions of confidence, authority, anxiety, or fear that we convey contribute to the total of our many cues and signals. If you try to control particular elements of your nonverbal presentation, you run two risks. Number one, when you try to balance your attention between manifest and latent content, you're likely to look self-conscious. It's difficult to operate on two channels at once, and people who are trying to change some part of their natural style often appear detached, awkward, unfocused, or self-conscious. Psychologists have a name for this, inappropriate effect. Your contact is more likely to call it weird. Two, your contacts, who are themselves sophisticated receivers of nonverbal signals, may feel they're being manipulated when you pointedly cross your arms and lean back or encroach across the midpoint of their desks. They won't enjoy being sucked into an unspoken power struggle, and the meeting will either ramble off track or become a battle of wills. When networking, it's far more important to appear focused attentive and interested than it is to keep yourself on the alert for sudden pupil dilation. Leave your hunches to their own devices. Nature is set it up that way and the arrangement serves you well without, without your trying to over control or intellectualize it. When you detect a sudden disharmony between the words and the music, don't override your intuition. Try to pinpoint the moment you became aware of that funny feeling and to recall what happened just at that moment. If there's no obvious reason for a sudden change in someone's demeanor, like when you said you trying to make a statement with that tie herb, <laughs> you can try a quick reality check. Here are some examples. I like examples. Marv, I may be wrong, but you seem uncomfortable with my explanation about why I left amalgamated. Does that need some clarification? Susan, you look perplexed. Maybe I should rephrase that last point. I sense that my response may have irritated you, Herman. I am not sure why. I didn't intend to be cavalier. Have I touched a nerve? <laughs> wow. Wouldn't it be great if we all had that level of empathy and compassion for other people? If your attempt at damage control is done politely and sincerely, the other person often will tell you what signal is causing the reaction. If the meeting is threatening to jump the tracks, your candor may save the day. The eyes have it, so watch your mouth. There are two noteworthy exceptions to the basic idea that you should just be yourself and let your natural style find free expression. One, eye contact, and two, rate of speech. In our culture, the eyes are the window to the soul. Strong, solid eye contact conveys candor and trust. In some other cultures, lowered eyes are a sudden a signal of deference, not shame, or an attempt to hide the truth. Most people tend to break eye contact when thinking, when, then reestablish it when speaking or listening. But too many of us are shy or have gotten lazy in our habits. In a conversation, we tend to spend more time out of eye contact than in it, creating an impression of either evasiveness or lack of interest. Ever felt like that? Evaded or lack of interest? You can improve your eye contact simply by forcing yourself to think about it. It's a behavior that you can modify over time until it becomes natural to engage eye contact more strongly or until you've mastered the knack of looking natural as you consciously remind yourself to spend more time staring into someone's eyeballs. If looking at someone's eyes makes you too uncomfortable, try focusing on the bridge of the nose right here. It works almost as well. Networking meetings probably aren't the best places to practice. In fact, they're not. Uh, in, and, you know, certainly practicing with a mirror or yourself or a good friend would be a, a great idea. 
Until you've mastered this new behavior, you're apt to be inconsistent in your eye contact, which will unnerve the people you're meeting with. Practice during regular day-to-day -day interactions where nothing is at stake. Hello, motor mouth. Your rate of speech may not be something you're terribly aware of, but the, those listening to you are. Under the stress of a networking meeting, you're being judged, you are responsible for maintaining the pace, and you must keep within agreed time, time constraints. You might speak, speak faster than normal, run sentences together, and breathe on the fly in rapid sucking gasps. This is called pressured speech. In addition to betraying nervousness and a lack of self-confidence, your delivery may give contacts the impression that they shouldn't interrupt your torrent of words. They won't. They'll let you keep talking. You, in turn, won't understand why they're so silent, which will make you more nervous, which will make you talk still faster until you find yourself over-controlling the meeting with your speech rate. Under networking pressures, many people lapse into inter... inter anyway, uh, the pitch of their voice tends to rise sharply at the end of almost every phrase or sentence. It sounds like they're asking a series of questions, and it's the way eight-year-olds tend to talk. If you want to hear what it sounds like, just read the following aloud. Um, I was born just north of, north of Chicago. My dad was a CPA who wanted me to join his firm. I went to a parochial school in high school and then to Valparaiso College in Indiana. I found I was not good at math, so I majored in political science. I graduated summa cum laude, so I got into Columbia. After I got my PhD in 1983... <laughs> That's funny. I joined the State Department. As an adult, this speech pattern conveys a lack of confidence. That's called an upswing. So an upswing uh, would convey lack of confidence. A downswing conveys confidence. It implies such concerns as, how am, I, how am I doing? Does this make sense? Do you believe me? Am I talking too much? Yes, you are. Uh, do you like me? It also tends to make all phrases equal. Important points sound just like incidental points. Talk this way and you'll sound as if you're not interested in your own conversation. Lights, camera. Speech and eye contact patterns show up readily on video. If you have any qualms about your style, put your camcorder or tripod uh, on a tripod so you can face and talk to a family member or friend. Have a 10 minute conversation. You'll need the first five minutes just to forget the camera is recording your every move. That includes your two-minute drill, your tail, and your objectives. Play it back at regular speed first. Look at patterns for eye contact and listen for the timbre and rate of your speech. Then rewind it and play it through on fast forward, looking particularly at your hand gestures and posture. If your hands are in constant motion, dart around, or too the theatrical, this usually means they fly out past your body plane resemble a hummingbird in flight, or include nervous patterns, tapping fingers, playing with glasses or pencils, and so on, the high-speed playback will make this very clear. In real life, your hands and habits may be distracting. The best way to quiet such mannerisms is to become calm and confident about who you are and what you're doing. Calm and confident about who you are and what you're doing. Working piecemeal to correct significant mannerisms is tough and often unproductive. It may make you look like a talking dog. <laughs> That's great. Whom do you like? Let's return to credibility, authority, affiliation, and likability. This last attribute builds on the first three. Whom do people like? First and foremost, they like people who make them comfortable. Okay, you say, but what makes them comfortable? Ask that question of a potential employer, and the first thing he'll say is, What makes me comfortable is solid evidence that a potential employee really is capable of adding value I'm going to pay him for. Because you're not selling anything to a networking contact, his first response is, I'm most comfortable with people who are like me. The next question is, then, what does like me mean? It means that you share a general value system defined broadly as the set of norms and values you support. What are those for you? The private sector in the United States, for example, generally adheres to the 
upper, upper middle income value system, which places a hard, high premium on hard work, results, team play, and aspiration for greater authority, visibility, and status, all frequently measured in terms of dollars and earning power. This value set is strongly anchored in a pressure toward conformity. The nonprofit sector's hub is providing service or adding values to other human beings. Income maximization is secondary to other measures of worth, collaboration, and team play are accorded high priority. This value set is anchored in the norms and affiliations of community. The academic sector values the attainment of knowledge and understanding is willing to forego some earning capacity in exchange for the thrill of enlightenment and imparting that knowledge to others and tends to reward individual autonomous exploration more than the other value systems do. Its value anchor tends to be individuality. Each of these broad value systems recognizes the existence and worth of the other systems, but regards its own systems as being better. Showing sensitivity to the diversity of other people's hot buttons doesn't require you to become a bootlicking sycophant or a chameleon. Integrity is essential to successful self-preparation, excuse me, self-presentation in any setting, but you should be attuned and respectful to the values of your networking contact. Wow, no greater words have been spoken. You should be attuned and respectful to the values of of your networking contact, even if they're not your own. Even if they're not your own. If you can condescend to your networking contact or show disdain for something he cares about, his bowling trophy, his pair of matched Purdy over and under shotguns, his volunteer of the year award, or the software program he created himself, he'll take offense, become defensive, and decline to provide you with any meaningful help. On the upside, people with similar operative values tend to like each other and develop rapport quickly and easily. This helps explain why some meetings develop a splendid momentum, why others just clunk along. You will need to collect names. You'll probably get more referrals and offers of personal support from contacts who are wired like you. When you blow it, hopefully you won't, but when you blow it, Many networkers go through meetings as if they're walking on eggs. They gingerly tiptoe around trying to be perfect. Their efforts at self-control are so extreme that their knuckles gleam white on the arms of the chair, which they never dare to move their hands, lest they knock over the coffee. They live in terror that they'll lose their train of thought, forget the name of their last employer, or have to pause to collect their thoughts or take a second stab at answering a question. This extreme care is counterproductive. In terms of personal presentation, it's okay to be human. As a big bird, as Big Bird and Mr. Rogers tell us, all humans make mistakes, and nothing terrible happens when they do. Be as focused as possible, have your facts straight, and be attentive. But know that we are all occasionally lose our train of thought, get distracted, spill coffee down our front, or call people by the wrong name. Nobody loses many style points for exhibiting universal human vulnerabilities. Wow, no truer word said. Nobody loses many style points for exhibiting universal human vulnerabilities. When you make a mistake, blow your, blow your lines, get tongue-tied, or have your mind go blank. Not if, but when it's going to happen sometimes. Acknowledge the problem rather than pretend nothing happened. If you try to cover up some gaffe, your attempt requires the other person to go along with the pretense and both of you become uncomfortable. In such situations, a magic phrase can stabilize things and enlist the other person's empathetic tendencies. Please bear with me. We noted earlier in the book that there's a universal tendency toward empowerment. Ask for a little help and you'll get a little help. The request to bear with you while you collect yourself, gather your thoughts, or sponge off your tie is easy to grant. And most people will graciously and sincerely. Here are some examples of the magic phrase and its variations. These are really good. George, my fountain pen seems to have developed a leak and ink is all over my fingers. I can't touch anything without smudging it up. Could you bear with me for a minute while I go down the hall and wash off my hands? And when I get back, might I borrow a pen that doesn't leak? Laura, I'm sorry. 
While you were speaking, an eagle flew by outside and I got totally distracted. Could you tell me again who the movers and shakers are at Amalgamated Mining? Jed, I'm going to have to ask you to bear with me today. My allergies are really kicking up. My sinuses are filled and every time I look, I look into the bright light from the window behind you, it's like a shot in the head. If it looks like I'm not making strong eye contact, it's certainly not because I'm not interested. Mr. Smithers, I know you've repeated it twice, but I have to confess that I still don't understand your question. I'm sorry if it appears that I'm hopelessly thick, but I'll, I'd still rather ask you to clarify your point than pretend I understand what you're driving at and trying to bluff through an unresponsive answer. I like that. Just be honest. People understand. War story. No murder in the courtroom. An inexperienced young trial lawyer stood at the podium before a notoriously tyrannical judge. The lawyer was methodically cross-examining a witness in excruciatingly boring detail from a lengthy outline. On page 14, on page 15, on page 16. He chugged along, determined not to betray his anxiety. The jury regarded him with boredom and contempt. He could tell they thought he was a tightly wrapped perfectionist. But he didn't dare relax. He plodded on. Page 27, page 28, page 41. Page 41? He suddenly realized that more than 10 pages of the outline were missing. Thunderstruck, he lurched back from the podium and without thinking, croaked up at the for forbidding presence in black. Judge, not your honor or may it please the court. My notes just went from page 28 to page 41. Could you bear with me a second while I get my act together? The judge paused and then softened. Of course, counsel. It happens to the best of us. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, why don't we take a brief recess while the defense counsel uh, gets his act together? Miracle of miracles, the judge hadn't held him in contempt or ridicule him. Better yet, when the jury filed in from the recess, he noticed that a few of them smiled at him and one shrugged knowingly. He realized that he had just gone from being a blue-suited boar uh, to a fallible, likable human being. He relaxed, then the jury relaxed. It was a lesson he never forgot. Wrecking Rapport Unfortunately, not all human networking sins go unpunished. Some miscues aren't the result of forgivable foibles. They stem from indifference, inattention, inflexibility, and indolence. They immediately and often prematurely ruin any chance of lasting rapport. Tardiness, for example, is inexcusable. Never be late. You've asked for a little time, yet your behavior shows that you're careless about the context schedule. In their rush to line up as many meetings as possible, many networkers cut uh, the margins too fine. If an earlier meeting goes terrifically well and therefore runs long, if there's a jackknifed tractor trailer on the expressway, if there's no parking close by, or if you discover you don't really know how to get there, you suffer the embarrassment of having abused the contact's time. This is one of the best reasons you need to ask people for their cell phone numbers. That's one of the number one pieces of information that I encourage all of my coaching clients to procure, is that if you get in a position where you are late, you need to call and apologize and reschedule, okay? If they're still willing to wait on you, then fine, but don't make that a part of the deal. Plan logistics far more conservatively than, than you think you need to. Buy a street map and actually plot the route, well, we have GPS today, with a colored marker. Bring extra money for parking. Have the contact's phone number handy. If you get hung up, use your car phone or duck into a booth to explain the delay and to update your estimated time of arrival. Uh, I would really encourage you to print out instructions or, or directions um, or ask the person there uh, for directions or the best, best places to park. Clothes can be another problem. This book isn't about dressing for success, but too many networkers give little thought to appropriate attire. You're showing your game face in networking and you should dress the way you would for work, erring a bit on the dressed up side. If you're meeting a person you didn't know or someone of distinctly higher rank than you, show deference by dressing slightly more formally and conservatively than you might otherwise. Rapport builds on respect. Overly casual attire suggests a casual attitude about the meeting. Dress that tries to make an individual statement, a buckskin jacket with a 
two foot fringe, or a flamboyant red dress with football player shoulder pads suggests that creating an impression is more important than building rapport. The basic rule for dress is be remarkable, be remarkable unremarkably. Be remarkable unremarkably. How you dress should suggest that you care about your appearance without fixating on it. Understatement is best. Any clothing item or accessory that says, look at me, will tend to shout louder than the message than the message you're trying to convey with your mouth. Pay extra attention to personal hygiene before heading to networking meetings. Your nails, your hair, your breath, your facial hair, and body odor are all on parade and are capable of ruining an otherwise positive image. Take nothing for granted. That's great. Actually, that's the best advice in this whole chapter. Take nothing for granted. One sin is committed all too often. A networker rushes into a meeting, expecting and hoping for immediate gratification and help. If he doesn't learn or receive something of value instantly, he concludes the meeting is a dud. Shuts down all attention systems and sits there like a lump, waiting for it to end. Contacts, of course, read this checking out behavior. They can't check out. The meeting is in their office. But any perceived lack of interest on your part will be fatal to your chances of future referrals or being remembered favorably. Even if you're bored silly by the contacts pointless or unfocused banter, you must continue to look interested. This is an art that can be mastered with practice. Head nods, confirming comments. Yes, I see. Oh, that's interesting. You know, I never thought of it that way. That's called affirmation. Um, so that would be uh, nodding your head, that's a, that's a visual cue, uh, and strong eye contact. Never prop your chin in your hand, examine your fingernails, yawn, or sigh. Try to read anything on the contacts desk upside down. You must work hard to stay in the meeting for the whole meeting, rather than being distracted. A final rapport record is a failure to read the red lights and the green lights that the contact displays during the meeting. You will have an agenda, but if you keep charging ahead without conducting some ongoing reality checks, you may miss the contact sigh of boredom, drumming fingers of impatience and look of confusion, all suggesting a need for clarification. One bit of body language is pretty clear cut. When the contact stands up, except to fetch something, the meeting is over. Close as quickly as you can, get your thank you done pronto and promise to follow up later. The most tragic miss signal is running a green light. Missing some signal that your get-together has changed from a networking meeting to a meeting at which the contact is expressing interest in you as a possible employee. Some green lights are hard to miss. What would you think about working in a place like this? Wouldn't that be amazing? Is a pretty clear indication that the person is thinking about your potential contributions to his company. Not uncommon if you do enough network meetings that someone's going to start asking you interview questions. And you'll see a distinct pivot in a network meeting from just a casual conversation to one of um, evaluating your capabilities. Even if you get this light, don't jump the gun by saying, oh, is there a job here for me? That's true. You'll be pushing the envelope. There's probably not an existing job, but a discussion that might lead to the creation of a role that is custom tailored around you. Wouldn't that be great? The appropriate reaction in such cases, even if you're not interested, is to express polite interest and ask the contact to elaborate on his thinking. That's an intriguing thought, Malcolm. What kinds of needs and priorities do you have that lead you to think I might be available to make a contribution? What a great script. Be on the alert for subtler green lights. When a contact asks you to stimulate behavior or respond to a hypothetical, that clearly pertains to his company, the stakes probably have changed. Sally, have you ever managed a sales force in a situation like we have here, where the regions operate totally autonomous, autonomously of each other? That's an interview question. How did you handle the inconsistencies in the way they used to set quotas and allocate commissions? Luke, I note your asset management accomplishments with some interest. We acquired a number of promising properties that may still be strong performers in the long run, but are killing us now. Did you ever face the problem of trying to balance short-term and long-term returns in a real estate market that was this unpredictable? What, do you, what did you do? So that's person seeking advice. 
they then think you're at least a peer, maybe even a potential uh, new hire. When you get a green light, understand that the networking meeting has ended and your agenda has been superseded by a new agenda that the contact controls. You've moved into the twilight zone of the uh, pronto interview. You're being sized up in a different way, but you aren't in a standard screening or hiring interview where the responsibility, stakes, and authority of the job are clear. The key here is to maintain your patience and flexibility. When you're being measured this way, just stand still and be measured. Be cooperative, responsive, and curious. Green lights often take a long time, numerous meetings over several months. I hope not, but that, that could happen. To get the go-no-go -no -go decision point. Any opportunity is very fragile at the stage, at this stage and is sustained primarily by rapport and a potential for mutual self-interest. So what, what I would suggest here is make sure you ask follow-on questions. Is if somebody says something like, hey, what have you done in this situation? Well, well these are the kind of things I've done. How, how, how have you, what have you tried? Uh, do you think that would work here? Right? Get some sort of affirmation and, and ask follow-on questions to, to push that conversation along. Uh, and then I would also think about the fact that um, what is the current status? What is the current state? Because it could be that this person just had somebody quit today uh, or they had to let somebody go. That, I'm sure that never happens, right? Um, or perhaps that person retired um, or relocated uh, or decided to pursue an interest in education, right? Whatever that looks like. There's always a reason that they're asking that question and it's likely to slot you uh, into an opportunity or it allows you to at least be known as a subject matter expert or an asset. Uh, war story, the death of the laser. In the late 1960s, after, after an early career as a corporate controller and CPA, Dale decided to learn something about computers in order to automate his CPA practice. He showed considerable natural aptitude. Three years later, he was a programming moonshot. He was programming moonshot profiles for NASA under contract to a major computer manufacturer. In the following 17 years, it was recognized that Dale, a tall, quiet, rather awkward man, could create a sophisticated quantitative model to measure or describe anything. Dale acquired the nickname, The Laser, because his managers would wheel him in, focus him on a project, and say in effect, Dale, zap it. And he would, from human resources allocation studies to energy utilization projections, to economic modeling, to competitor analyses worldwide. He was amazing. He also was unhappy because he never was given co continuing responsibility of any of these projects. He just got wheeled on to the next project. Dale was delighted when his job was eliminated in a merger, although he was apprehensive about having to run a job search for the first time. Because his computer skills were so esoteric, he decided his best chance was to market himself as a controller or chief financial officer of a small or rapid growing manufacturing business. He began networking with other CFOs talking about opportunities in financial management. At the end of one fairly unproductive networking meeting, his contact said, Dale, I'm sorry, but I've got to go now. I'm part of a business development group that's meeting to try to figure out how to market our services in both Israel and the Middle East. We just can't figure those markets out. Ah, Dale said. Very tough. I had a hard time doing that market analysis. Took forever to build a model we found reliable. What? said the contact. Market analysis? I thought you were a financial manager. I can do either, Dale said agreeably. I just thought my best shot would be as a controller or a CFO. The contact stared at him. Dale, he said hoarsely. We would kill to find someone who could develop a sophisticated marketing and computer analysis model of that area for us. Yeah, well, gee, stammered Dale. I, uh, I thought you were going to uh, give me some names that I might call for more networking. Stop. Do not pass go. Do not collect anything. <laughs> Just say yes. Don't say no for the hiring manager or the hiring team or the person on the other side. Don't say no for them. What's in a name? As you have more and more meetings and become increasingly confident, you're going to discover a subtle dynamic. There's a mild tension between showing appropriate deference and projecting a sense of authority and control. This is particularly true in meetings between men because men tend to orient around issues of control. Women tend to be more consensus oriented, so the issues of who drives this meeting usually aren't as ticklish. One specific area where the tension shows itself is in figuring out 
how to address someone. Transactional analysis tells us that in any interaction, each party tends to assume the symbolic posture of a child, passive and powerless, a parent, judgmental and directive, or an adult, rational and logical. Generally, the best meanings work adult to adult. Each side is entitled to due deference. Neither side wants to assume a subordinate posture. For networkers, this means either starting on a first name basis or getting to one as soon as possible. The networker already has given away a bit of power on being uh, the one to have to ask for the meeting and continuing to call someone Mr. X or Ms. Y only emphasizes that disparity. Where the contact is a great deal older, higher in status or more powerful than the networker, the added deference of the formal address may be called for and reverting to a first name basis without specific permission to do so may sound presumptuous and disrespectful. If your age and that of the contact are within about 15 years, it's probably safe to call someone by his or her first name. Indeed, many people welcome the added personalization that goes with being called by name. If that issue is in doubt, you can always ask, do you mind if I call you Ed? A problem arises if Ed says, no, I think you should, uh, I think that would be unduly familiar. Rapport is shot. You're stuck in a child parent transaction. You've just been mildly punished for your stupidity and the meeting is unlikely to feel very pleasant to either of you. Accordingly, many networkers feel that the first name, last name problem is best avoided by staying away from the name address altogether. Sometimes this works fine. At other times, it gets awkward at those points in the conversation. Greeting, departing, expostulating, and so on. Where a name usually is properly spoken, think about this issue before going in to each meeting. Figure out how you're going to play it. Then be consistent. That concludes uh, the first half of chapter six. We'll go through the second half of chapter six next time. So speaking of names, I think it's appropriate just to ask somebody. You know, if they if you get their first name, last name, and, and then you take a look at that and you're like, okay, uh, how would you like to be addressed? Um, do you go by Mr. This or Mr. That? Um, how would you like to be ad addressed? Um, and so that's how I would handle that. But if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those now. I'm going to go through the chat and see what we have here. Okay. Ah, what is this about? Well, we're actually doing a book club. And the book we're reading right now is this National Business Employment Weekly book on networking. You can pick that up. I believe there's a link in all of the platforms that we have here. So if you look in the, um, the show notes or the uh, uh, section attached with the comments, uh, you'll see that there is information there on procuring the book because I think we all know the number one way to find work today is through the networking. However, there's a lot that goes on in a networking conversation and process that many people don't know how to execute best, best practice. Um, so that's what we're covering today is my uh, bookcase is full of plenty of books that tell me that I should network, uh, that networking is important and why it's important, but very few of them actually tell me how to network. And that's what, that's what we're covering today. So thanks for asking. Uh, what was the name of the book again? I think uh, it would also be helpful. Today's topic is great. It's fitting. Yeah. So it's um, the National Business Employment Weekly book on networking, if you can see that. Uh, it should be in the, in the notes attached. <laughs> yes. So we are doing, um, on top of that, uh, just off topic, I'm putting together a small group to go through Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why. And we're going to start that next Tuesday. So if you're interested, please join us. Okay. Any other questions out there? St looks like we still have a handful of people here. Oh, um, and so we're going to actually meet uh, for this book club by Zoom. Uh, so if you're interested, uh, procure the book. Start with why. Uh, if you already have a um, if you already have a copy of that, then uh, read section one and uh, reach out to me, uh, private message or um, what have you, and say I want to be in the Simon Sinek book club. Okay, we're going to read it together, and then Simon's going to have on Fridays. Um, he's going to do something on YouTube live and answer questions. So the objective is to read the book, come with your questions, and then he's going to answer all the questions uh, on a live stream on Fridays. 
So we'll meet, I think, on Wednesdays, and he'll have his thing on Fridays. Yes, good. Thank you, Chelsea. Appreciate those questions. Awesome. Any other questions out there? Hope you all are doing well, that you're healthy and happy. Um, I would encourage you to reach out to anybody and just make sure they're okay. Uh, maybe somebody that you hadn't reached out to in a while. Um, I do appreciate you coming to these things. Pass the word. Share this with people you know. Uh, let them know that we're here every Friday. And right now we're going through this book. It's um, I think it's 11 chapters. So we only have a, a handful more weeks to go through the book. Uh, and then we'll have it done. Uh, the reason I'm going through this, quite honestly, is because I'm a big fan of audiobooks. And if I can get um, this produced through this method and have it available to people on, say, something like YouTube, then then um, I, I believe that I'm doing people a service. But, um, yeah, thank you. Appreciate that. Any other questions out there? Happy to answer. Go ahead and put them in the chat. All right, folks, I'll be hanging out here in the chat for just a little while longer, uh, but I'll switch off the camera and the microphone, and, and if you have any questions, I'll answer those uh, in the chat after today's session. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next Career Happy Hour.